Hey yo, so we're finally back after a fairly long hiatus. We've been pretty busy doing a bunch of different stuff. The studio is finally done, built, ready to start doing mocap. Jed built the switch port for our previous game, The Pedestrian. So we've been busy with a lot of stuff. We've put quite on set on the back burner kind of, but now finally we're back full swing. Here we go, episode 10. Yeah. So, we bought a booth at a local game convention here in Columbus, Ohio, and it's rapidly approaching in October. We roughly have like six months before we need a playable demo of Quiet On Set for the convention. Come heck or high water, we have to have something to show at the convention or it's yes. gonna be really embarrassing. So follow along with us. We're gonna be scrambling to make something look awesome and you guys are gonna see us struggle through this whole thing. So here are some of the things that we've been working on recently. So, if you haven't seen Daniel with hair, this is what he looks like with hair. Getting good facial animation is a really big topic, especially for our game. And that's one of the selling points for us moving to Unreal Engine. Their MetaHuman animator is pretty sweet and we've done some testing with it. We just used their basic, like, I think they call it mesh to MetaHuman. So we had already had like somewhat of a high quality scan of Daniel's head. We took that that scan, I actually went into Photoshop, I did like a transfer from the high poly model to the low poly model for textures, and then I put that texture onto this. This is the basic MetaHuman head with just a single albedo texture. And even the head is slightly off. It's not great yet. There's a lot of things that we wanna really level up. We wanna take the MetaHuman like default head and like really customize it to get the likeness of the actors that are portraying our characters. Right now, the MetaHuman heads, they kinda look a little generic and they don't really look like the person. Not until you get some high res scans of that person, you're not really going to get their likeness very well. Just for the time being, we used an iPhone and with its LiDAR camera or something, it's able to capture a 3D representation of Daniel's face as he's talking in front of the iPhone. And then through their MetaHuman animator process, you're able to apply that animation directly to the head that we made. If we're not back by dawn, call the president. Once we put more work into actually making this face Daniel's, face. We're hoping a lot of these like weird kind of stretchy things, we're hoping we get rid of those. I don't know why. <laughs> I don't know why I did this. We, uh, I don't know this. There was something wrong with it. As you can tell, <laughs> it's beautiful. <laughs> oh gosh. It can only get better after this. In that same vein with uh, character creation, you gotta work on the body of the character too. And we've been doing a lot of motion capture testing. Ultimately, what we want to do is stream our motion capture sessions directly into Unreal Engine so that we can actually see the character we're controlling while we're acting out the scene. Here's a clip right here where we tried it out and the, uh, the scaling of the character versus the scale of my actual body was totally off. So it looked completely ridiculous. <laughs> but at least we were able to get that pipeline in place. And it was really simple. Yeah, and one thing we didn't mention in our motion capture introductory video was you can see behind me, our carpet tiles are exactly two by two feet and we purposefully picked that so that we can have a very distinct grid on the floor that matches with a grid we will build inside of Unreal Engine. We can take that grid, move it anywhere in the game, and that will represent our motion capture volume mm -hmm. so that we can say, okay, we need to move to a scene at the barbershop. Yeah. So let's just drag the volume in the game over here in the barbershop, and now we know exactly where we are. We can also, with the carpet tiles, we can almost do like a like a battleship kind of thing where it's like, oh, A4, you know, and this particular carpet tile in the real world corresponds to that grid pattern in Unreal. So we can do stuff like that where it's like, oh, go stand on A4. That we, we know is like the starting point or whatever. Let's give you a little preview of what we've been doing with the buildings in our game. We're kind of switching approaches a little bit. We're kind of going in the 
direction of the more traditional modular buildings. But the good thing is, is that we can still go in multiple directions with that. We can go in the traditional, just instanced pieces, all building up something, or we can go with the approach, which is what we want, is the more like every single building is unique and all the vertices within like a structure are unique and then we can give it like wobble and we can give it, we can make it feel more like natural. The starting point doesn't really matter. We're gonna start with this and then we can go in a bunch of different directions. So these are modular pieces for the fantasy area. So the, the fantasy area, we actually found this town in France that we really wanna model our fantasy area after. It's like super cool. We went into Blender and we made a whole bunch of different pieces. So we've got like different roof pieces, different wall pieces and little odds and ends. So we have all those, those modular pieces and then we have the building input shapes. So this is where Daniel would come in and he would make the shape of a building just with simple geometry. We'll take this input shape and then inside of Houdini, it will grab the input shape and take all the pieces and then stitch it all together and make the building. And so in here, we can do fancy stuff. It's really simple right now, but we can do fancy stuff in the future where we can determine, you know, automatically like where we want windows like smartly because this is kind of a dumb way to do it or whatever. But then inside of Unreal, we actually took all this and we built out the fantasy area. So this is the very start of the game. You will actually be in this barn. I didn't make the barn. And you're, you're gonna wake up in the barn and you'll surface from here into this fantasy area. And you're like, oh, what's happening? You're gonna look up and there's a castle. Then you'll, you'll start looking around, trying to figure out where you are, exploring this little fantasy area. Cross this bridge. Oh, oh what's this? Oh, it's more fantasy area. And then it gets into the studio back lot. We, we want to make like a base pass over the entire game that is at this level. And then from there, we can go in and start refining it and improving all the areas and putting in all the little details. But for now, this kind of like bare bones structure to get in there is what we need. So I thought I'd share with you kind of my uh, writing process that I've learned over the years is this four step process. When I wanna write a story, I start out with the blue sky phase. That's where you just, you just create a document and you just start writing everything that you want in the story. Just any kind of crazy idea, just get it all out there. And then once you're done with the blue sky take out the crap and you put it into an actual outline that makes a logical structure. And these are just short paragraphs that describe a beginning, middle, and end just to get all of your blue skying into a structured story form and then you go from that what I like to use some people will use like an actual physical whiteboard or sticky notes what I find even more fun and easy is something like Miro this is a virtual whiteboard and this is where you can literally I have an idea just spilling everything out on this whiteboard you start taking that outline and visually structure it into a physical thing. Like you're taking a story and turning it into a visual thing. You can get reference photos, you can get whatever you want. Once you have a good outline, you'll be going back and forth from the outline to your whiteboard until you have everything that you think you need. And then you go into your script writing software and you actually start writing out the scenes. Once you have like a first draft, you'll wanna go back to the outline and see how did it turn out? Are there things that I like about it? Get feedback from people. Make some adjustments on your whiteboard. Brainstorm some more. Go back to your script. Do a second draft. Rinse and repeat that until you have a third or fourth draft and that's probably when you'll have a finished story. So concept art pieces I've been working on. One of the newer areas that we're kind of developing, it's like a frontier area. We want to keep having these little reminders in the environment that you're in this kind of closed set. So we have this big concrete wall with these big pillars supporting it all the way across here. And they utilize this whole wall across the different environments to reinforce a movie set. So this has these snow-capped mountains and stuff. This one I'm really excited about because it's an action chasing scene and where they, they get up inside of this fake pirate ship that's in a big water tank and eventually one thing leads to another and the pirate ship 
comes crashing down and breaks the water tank open and just floods the whole film set. One of the main things that you'll be interacting with in the game is this console in the back of the van. And so you get in there and you sit down in, in this rolling chair. And I wanted it to be this like really like classic World War II piece of furniture. Kind of put it in context here. So we've got the actual console that will be in the back of the van. Something that I just learned recently, which I think is kind of cool, is when you're doing perspective, you normally have your vanishing point and then you have your two. Two point perspective, you would have like, let's say a box right here. It goes there. So now we have a box in perspective but say, what, what if you want a box here that's rotated differently? Not everything can be locked to this grid space. So what you do is you take these two vanishing points and you just copy them and move them further down. This one will be like here and then this one will be like way over here out of view. So if we want to put the box like right here, say it goes to that point and then this one goes out there somewhere. So as long as you're keeping these new vanishing points on the horizon line, you can put them anywhere across the horizon line and they will look like they belong in the same space. You don't use that very often in art where things are like slightly off grid, but in real life, most everything is slightly off grid. So it's a good thing to know. And it helped me take this chair here and rotate it off perspective from that puppy. See, this goes way off in that direction somewhere. The more you know. I wanted to uh, kind of experiment more with um, starting a concept piece, block it out in 3D, and then render that block out. See, we have right here. This is the block out. I take this into Photoshop. Now I have pinpoint accurate perspective and all of that stuff that I really need and I can just paint right on top of it. And so you're not wasting time with all the calculations of how something lines up with something else. Concept art and writing the story have been my two main goals for a really long time. And it has been a real challenge because typically when you think of concept art, you think of spaceships and aliens and things that are not in the real world. 99% of everything in our game is from the real world. So it's hard to have things worth conceptualizing when we can just Google an image of it. Really what the goal with the concept art is getting the mood and the feel and the color palette and all of those things down. Which is a challenge because that's a really nuanced thing with concept art. So, getting our game on the Switch was like a super big milestone for us. Because we initially designed for PC, there's like a whole different set of constraints and everything when designing for PC. When we sat down to do the Switch, we really wanted to make sure that the visuals like didn't change. They were still like comparable between like the consoles and PC and the Switch. And then also we didn't want to just like shoehorn it in and not utilize the Switch's features. So uh, with the Switch, I think like, I feel like because it's a handheld in our game, there's a lot of like dragging things around. It just kind of makes sense to have the touch screen. We put a lot of work into making sure that all those things were working really well and you had like a really good experience. We don't want the Switch to be less than. And the crazy thing is after we finally got the, the game to where we were happy with it, we were actually talking and saying that like the Switch is kind of the best platform to play the game on. It just feels so nice like being able to sit down on like a couch and have like the screen right in front of you and then going between puzzle mode and play mode just feels like super natural. The other cool thing is too, we got the demo working. So I really love demos. I like when, when, when we were growing up, we had an old PlayStation and everything had demos. Like there were demos for like every game. And so it feels like, like a lot of games nowadays kind of forget demos. And, and so it, I, I think it's cool that like Nintendo, specifically on the Switch, seems like demos are like a really big deal. And it's just a lot of fun to have something that you can play, especially if you're like a kid and you don't really have, you know, the resources and money and everything. Just being able to go and download a bunch of different games and try it out is a lot of fun. Uh, normally, you know, you can just use the joysticks to move around. You can go into puzzle mode and then you can use the joystick and the select button to move the pieces around everything. But with the Switch specifically, you can just tap and drag. And it's just so fast. It's like, I think, because we're, we're so used to working with phones, like tapping and dragging is like a really, really natural interaction. 
In terms of like optimization, thankfully I was able to get it where a lot of the optimizations we did didn't change um, the way that the game looked. We we're able to get it running at 30 FPS, native resolution when you're when you're on the console, and then when you're hooked up to a TV, I think it goes to like 900p or something. Yeah, that, that's it. It's very exciting to get this finally on the Switch and have it finished on all the consoles and platforms. Just wanted to give you a little peek. Okay, so that's it. So you better get subscribed to see how mm. embarrassing this thing is gonna turn out to be. Or is it gonna be really awesome? Only one way to find out. Subscribe. <laughs> Thanks for watching. Uh, catch us in the next one. Peace.